Today I will uh, describe a part of uh, my research uh, and uh, it will be a slightly different topic uh, with respect to what we are here so far, but the idea is uh, to try to convey some of the idea behind the theory of resurgence. So maybe it will not be um, super detailed, but uh, uh, I hope uh, at the end of the, of the talk you will have at least uh, a flavor of what resurgence theory is about. And in fact, I, I should, I might have called this uh, um, seminal, this uh, talk, uh, what I like about the theory of resurgence. And uh, in fact, as you will start to see, so first of all, what does resurgence study? These are divergent power series, and uh, I'm not sure whether you have uh, already encountered divergent power series uh, in your studies, but they appear quite often in mathematics and physics. And in particular, if you study, for instance, differential equation, a certain class of differential equation, you might encounter divergent power series, and we will see example on that. And also, if you study asymptotic expansion or perturbative expansion, it's another source of divergent power series. And this is quite common uh, um, in uh, theoretical physics too. So in my first part, uh, in the first part of my, exp uh, of my talk, I will, sp I will precisely discuss uh, what divergent power series are and example of them. And then, uh, okay, once we understood what we can study with this theory, the, que the natural question is, uh, okay, what uh, uh, resurgence really does? And I think the, um, in, in a nutshell, the, the way we can express it is really to say it can find the new information. And this new information is what uh, uh, is captured classically at the level of the singularity, so studying singularities that we will see. And this was proposed long ago by Ekal, the father of uh, the theory of resurgence. And uh, more recently, what I've been studying with my collaborator Claudia Rella is that, uh, again, there is a new information that we can study and uh, understand by, looking, by using the technique of resurgence, but this is en uh, encoded in a different type of data, which is uh, what we will see uh, L function, which captures some Stokes constant. Okay. So, and please, uh, uh, if you have any question during my talk, don't hesitate to interrupt me. Okay. So, what are divergent power series? We will be working uh, in the uh, complex plane, and divergent power series uh, are um, infinite sum, so expression of this form, where these a n are coefficient, uh, which are complex number, and z is uh, a, f a variable. So in particular, uh, I will always denote uh, a series of this form with the, as element of C with this double bracket. Every time you see this double bracket really means uh, formal expression, this infinite uh, series. And uh, um, just to remind you what is the, co the complex plane, here you have uh, uh, just a cartoon, so you see it's like the plane R2. Um, I will usually write the variable z to remind uh, what is the coordinate that we use uh, on this plane. And the two axes are what we usually denote uh, the real and the imaginary part. And uh, um, so a as an example, here you see a, di a divergent power series. So you have this uh, n fact the coefficient uh, an are given by the factorial. And so this series, in fact, look like this infinite sum of uh, term. And uh, why is it divergent? Well, because uh, this series doesn't quite make sense. Uh, in a, if you, if there is no value of z for which uh, uh, this infinite sum gives uh, an actual uh, function. The only uh, value for which this makes sense is if you take z equal to zero, but that's not very interesting. So we say that this is divergent because uh, in a, it, it really doesn't make sense as a function. And opposite or divergent, of course, are convergent power series. So again, uh, uh, are infinite sum coefficient always in the complex plane. And now I'm using a different variable, this uh, zeta. So now these elements here are convergent uh, and will be denoted uh, as element uh, of C with now the, this curly bracket. And here you have an example. So again, uh, um, here I'm taking the sum where all the coefficient a n are one. You might expect that this series is also growing, so that in fact maybe doesn't make sense when you take the sum uh, all the way to infinity. But in fact, uh, um, for certain value of zeta, 
this is convergent. Uh, and uh, the value of zeta that are allowed are the one inside the unit disk. So again, this is a copy of the complex plane, but now in the variable zeta. And if you are in the gray region, so for zeta in this region, the series makes sense and this is convergent. It's in fact a function. And uh, um, I'm uh, highlighting in red the boundary because this uh, a priori is not allowed. If you take zeta equal to 1 and you sum 1 uh, all the way to infinity, this of course will give you infinity. So it's not convergent. But in fact, we can say even something more. When we have a convergent series, which uh, so at the beginning makes sense uh, in the disk, we can try to ask whether it there is an underlying function um, that resum the series. And this is in fact the case for this example. So this is the so-called geometric series, and the sum is known to be just the, the function 1 over 1 minus zeta. But now this function is, much better, is even better behaved. It is not that makes sense only for zeta in the disk, but in fact it makes sense uh, everywhere except at the point 1. You see that the only problem of this, uh, this function is when the denominator is 0 which means that zeta equal to 1. So this is the difference between convergent and divergent series. And let's try to see an example, uh, one of the first uh, source uh, of divergent uh, uh, power series. So you one source is what is, um, there is a class of differential equation uh, in the complex domain, which uh, has a so-called irregular singularity at a certain point. For instance, the equation that I write here as uh, um, is a first order differential equation. This is just one derivative uh, in Z. And uh, uh, it is uh, non-linear, sorry, it is linear, but uh, non homogeneous. So you have an extra Z uh, on the right hand side. And a way to solve a differential equation is to find, uh, um, to look for a solution, which is a formal expression as the infinite sum I was writing before. So if you substitute this infinite sum in the equation and you try to solve uh, recursively the coefficient, what you will find in this example is uh, that the coefficients are exactly n factorial. So in particular that this series is a solution uh, of this differential equation. And as we've seen before, it is divergent because the coefficients are growing too fast. So we can't make sense of that. Another source of example of a divergent power series is when we look at asymptotic expansion. So here the starting point is slightly different. We take uh, a function which is analytic and uh, uh, well defined. So for instance, uh, the gamma function, which, which is defined through this integral expression. So as a function of z, which is here, um, the gamma function is well defined and its domain uh, is the uh, right half plane that you see here. So it's defined for real part of z positive. But in fact, uh, if, you try if you look at the behavior of this function uh, far away, so as z goes to infinity, what you find uh, is what is known as the Stirling approximation. So in particular, it behaves uh, as follows. You have uh, uh, an exponential term, some constant, and a full uh, series now in inverse power of z because we are going at infinity with all these coefficients. And in fact, the coefficients are known explicitly and you can find them uh, um, in some sequence of integer uh, number online. So the idea is that uh, even if you have function which a priori are well defined and analytic uh, in a certain domain, when you look at the behavior at infinity or sometime at zero, they do not uh, um, they give a rise to divergent power series. And so how can we make sense uh, uh, of this uh, uh, function? So we start with, uh, with something that was analytic, we look at this asymptotic expansion, we, we find something divergent that so doesn't really make sense. And the point uh, is, uh, can we um, make sense of the divergent series in a certain way. And by make sense of them, it's really, if I start with the divergent series, can I find an analytic function, a well-behaved function, which was somehow related to the divergent series I started with. So for instance, uh, if, my starting, if I give you just the uh, asymptotic expansion of the gamma function without telling you that the underlying function was the gamma, is it possible by studying this uh, series to recover the gamma function? And you may ask uh, uh, this, the type, the similar type of question every time you have a divergent series. This is the idea of resumming the series. Now, there is a problem that uh, if you look at asymptotic expansion, 
in a certain way you are losing some information because you might have because different function might have the same asymptotic in a certain direction so a priori this question is highly non-trivial and uh, just to give you a, an, a bit of, a, of an example of a flavor why this happened is because if you for instance compare um, gamma of z and gamma of z plus this uh, exponential small term this e to the minus z well if you go at infinity the exponential in minus z essentially disappear this is somehow what the graph was, was, was is trying to tell you if you just go a bit far you, you can't really distinguish them so from an asymptotic level the two functions look the same but uh, um, they were not the same and so can we recover this uh, um, information that seems lost at the level of the asymptotic by doing certain procedure and the idea is that uh, um, if the series uh, the, the divergent series we are studying uh, is in fact resurgent the technique developed by the theory of resurgence uh, precisely tell us that yes we would be able to recover uh, the exponentially small correction and this is also what is uh, um, very useful uh, and interested um, for, uh, theor for theoretical physicists because in fact these are the sub-leading order contribution that they cannot have access at the level of the asymptotic because the asymptotic doesn't know them but if you do and if you use the resurgence analysis you will be able to recover them and this will tell you more information about the theory you are trying to study okay so if you don't have question about this divergent power series, uh, um, let's try to see how resurgent can help uh, studying them. And here, the, the main idea to have in mind is that, uh, so first of all, uh, um, what a resurgent series uh, does is the fact that although they are divergent, uh, they know uh, uh, they have more info, they contain more information. So by studying them, we have access to more information, which is useful to try to understand what the analytic function uh, is somehow hidden behind them. And the goal of the theory of resurgence is really to tell you how to compute and to extract this extra information. And we usually use both analytic and numerical methods because uh, it depends really um, how much information you know about the divergent series. So for instance, for the gamma function, as I was saying before, we have access to the full uh, list of coefficients. You can look it online. But sometimes we have function for which we don't know so many coefficient. And so in that case, it's much harder somehow to try to extract uh, new information. And so the, the question now and what I would like to discuss is really, OK, how do we do how we, what type of information we are looking for and how we can compute it? And in order to do that, uh, the first step is to consider what is known as the Borel transform. So this is a formal operation. Uh, which work at the level of the power series. It takes uh, as input uh, a formal power series, which is divergent, and it produces you another series, which now will be convergent. So here, essentially, what's happening is that you replace uh, um, this uh, z uh, to the n plus 1 with a new variable zeta n divided by n factorial. The idea is that divided by the factorial, uh, you will uh, um, this, uh, re uh, reduce the divergence uh, and in fact you will get something convergent and let's see in an example how does it work so again uh, I'm using this example where you simply have the coefficient uh, which is a factorial and if you use exactly the rule I gave you before well uh, you replace the, dead, the z to the n plus 1 with the zeta of course here the two factorial simplify and so you uh, just get back the uh, hypergeometric series now this is convergent when you see a series like that, as I was saying before, it's only convergent in a disk. A priori, it only makes sense for Z inside the unit disk. But uh, we already know that this series can be resummed. And so it's this uh, simple function, which is defined in a much larger domain. And so uh, the only singularity at the end of the day is the singular point at Z equal to 1. Typically, the step of uh, going from the power series to the function is non-trivial. So already at this step, Sometimes one has to rely on numerical technique to understand where the singularity are. Because uh, this is only the information about uh, uh, what the function knows about this disk. Okay, 
that's an example. Let's look at another example, which is uh, slightly more interesting. Now here, the divergence series is given by uh, as this coefficient. So you already see a factorial in the denominator, but in fact, uh, uh, this symbol here, are written a bit uh, uh, smaller downstairs, are given by this ratio of gamma function. Now, I haven't mentioned it before, but in fact, the gamma function uh, that I was writing as gamma of z, if z is an integer, this is n minus 1 factorial. So in this case, uh, since this, the, the growth of this gamma a plus n is in fact uh, um, as a factorial. So the numerator here has a two factorial. Um, in the denominator, you have a one factorial, so you are left with the one uh, factorial growth. That's why it's divergent. And if we compute the Borel transform, again, it's the same uh, um, technique. We get now an extra factorial, which uh, helps to compensate it to give a convergent series. And the, the, the radius of convergence, so the domain where this series makes sense, is now inside this disk of radius 2. But in fact, uh, again, also in this example, uh, we know more because uh, this series can be resummed, and we know that the sum is what is called an hypergeometric function. So um, th this, this hypergeometric function is not only convergent and defined in the disk, but in fact, it has only one singularity, um, which is at minus two. And uh, in fact, uh, uh, we can look closer to the singularity. So before we only had the problem uh, at the denominator. There was not much information in a sense to extract out of that. But in this case, we can try to see what, uh, uh, how this function behaves when we go close to the singularity. And if you try, for instance, numerically to uh, um, expand this, this function at the singularity, you can collect uh, um, the coefficient in front of the logarithm. And you see that there is uh, a new series which uh, appear uh, in front of the logarithmic term. And then you can uh, um, ignore, in a sense, or disregard like part of the other information, which will be part of a convergent uh, uh, series. So that's very interesting, because if you, essentially, this function is telling you something more. After you have uh, um, resumed this, uh, um, this convergent series, you get a function. And close to the singularity, you extract a little bit more of information. This will be uh, one important feature of a resurgent function or a resurgent series. And so let me now tell you what, uh, let me just give you a definition of what these resurgent series are. So a divergent series is uh, uh, resurgent if its Borel transform has the so-called endlessly analytic continuation. Now, this endlessly analytic continuation is not uh, a very precise mathematical definition. The idea, we can make it a bit more precisely, but I think for the purpose of my talk, is, uh, it's fine to leave it a bit uh, um, in, this, uh, uh, in this more abstract, uh, with, as a bit more abstract definition. But what endless mean, it's really that uh, um, you can understand how the function can be uh, understood outside the original radius of convergence, where the Borel transform uh, as a series is defined where the, uh, the image of the Borel transform is defined. And you can get access to all the singularity. So you, you start with your divergent series, you do the Borel transform. A priori, you might get stuck inside uh, the unit disk. If you get stuck inside, then the series is not resurgent. But if you can uh, um, understand where the singularity are and you so have a way also to go beyond these, uh, these, disc, uh, these ridges of convergence and try to understand the analytic continuation uh, of the function. So where there might be, you might find other singularity also outside, that's possible. But the idea is that you have access to all this information and you can understand it uh, in the full plane. So you can really, no matter in which direction you try to go and you study whether the function of singularity you will be always able to escape until infinity. And, and that's, as we have already seen in the last example, being able to understand the structure of singularity and study the function near the singularity is what might give you uh, new information. Before it was really, there was a new series appearing near the logarithmic singularity. 
So this definition uh, goes back to, to ECAL, but in fact it has been, uh, um, there are also equivalent definitions given by uh, other, uh, other people like David Cezanne and uh, also Konsevich and Soibelman here at IHS. Okay, so that's somehow the idea. And in fact, uh, uh, maybe if you like, uh, as a sort of exercise, so you can try to think whether, what is a series uh, with this uh, behavior that gets stuck in the unit disk and cannot be continued outside. And uh, you can even start from, uh, so the series I was uh, writing before. This we have already seen is resurgent because it has only a singularity, but you can try to modify it so that uh, in fact it is going to be stuck uh, in, the, in the disk and you cannot extend it. Okay, but so let me just uh, uh, quickly mention uh, uh, a sort of remark about who, is, who developed this theory and who is currently working on that uh, here at the Institute. So the theory was uh, developed by, by Jean Ecal in the 80s. Uh, who is a professor at uh, Laboratoire Mathematique d'Orsay uh, as part of Paris-Saclay. But in fact, since then, it has attracted many more interest and it will be almost impossible to list all the people that are also currently working uh, on the theory, with the theory of resurgence, both in mathematics and physics. And many of them are also around uh, in the, in the Paris-Saclay area. But more precisely here at IHS, uh, um, Maxim Konsevich is working uh, on, the, on the theory of resurgence, we had a conference last week uh, for his uh, 60th birthday, and if you check online, you might see uh, also videos uh, of uh, talks uh, precisely about resurgence. His uh, close collaborator, Jan Soibelman, is currently visiting IHS, and he will be spending here um, one year. So in fact, if you have also questions uh, and you are nearby, it will be uh, nice to discuss with them as well. And. Uh, as in the group of Maxim, there are other postdoc. I was one of them, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm moving uh, soon to Orsay. But there is Campbell Wheeler, who is a collaborator, and uh, is one of the postdoc also um, founded by the Huawei um, program. And Claudia Rella, uh, she's uh, coming, uh, she will start her postdoc soon. She was in Geneva as a PhD, and she will start again um, as part of the Huawei program in the group of Maxim. So you have people around that are working on this theory, and if you are interested, uh, they, are, uh, they would be very happy to discuss with you as well. But OK, so let's now try to understand uh, um, a little bit better this idea that uh, once we have a resurgence series and we have all the singularity, we can uh, go and extract more information out of them. This is our running example about uh, uh, this divergent series with factorial growth. So as I said, it's resurgent because we know that uh, the only problem is uh, at one, and that's it. In the technical uh, uh, language, this point is called a simple pole. And uh, what is the new information that you can extract uh, at a simple pole is what is called a residue. Essentially, is a uh, uh, just uh, this uh, constant 2 pi i, which is nothing but uh, um, a, after a certain normalization given by this uh, value here, the one. So the idea is that you start, uh, you have your singularity here to compute a residue is nothing but taking a loop around it and compute a certain integral. So you, in this case, uh, the integral we are computing is uh, the integral of e to the minus uh, z, uh, um, zeta 1 on 1 minus zeta along this contour here. And typically we take 1 to pi i. Okay. So it's just an information that you can extract at the singularity very computing this, this integral. Okay, that's not the most interesting type of singularity we can uh, encounter because again, as I said, the only information is a, cer a certain constant. But uh, if you look at the other example, that it became a bit more interesting. And we have already seen uh, um, part of it. So again, this is the series I was writing at the beginning. Now I call it with this capital Phi 1. Again, it's resurgent because we know after we take the Borel transform, we get this hypergeometric function. And now, um, as we were seeing before, there was a, a logarithm appearing when we look at the singularity. So this means that the type of singularity is not a simple pole. 
it is a, what we call a logarithmic branch point. And that's why here now I'm drawing this uh, um, red line to say, in a sense, there is really a cut. We can't do this uh, loop like that. We can try to go around. But if we go around, uh, in fact, what we found uh, is uh, the, the other series that was written just uh, after the logarithm. And uh, uh, again, there is a kind of normalization constant we can consider. In this case, will be i. Uh, which was just the coefficient in front of the series uh, phi 2, as it was appearing before. This is the new information, but that's now is interesting because this function, this series phi 2 is convergent. And so, in fact, uh, we also know that uh, uh, it has an underlying function. So it is, uh, there is a, a function, another hypergeometric. Now here, the only thing that changes is the sign. And uh, this new hypergeometric function can be studied and have, uh, again, its own singularity. Now, it's uh, not at minus 2, but at plus 2. So again, we had that, um, a convergent series. We found its sum. It has singularity. The singularity will be, again, a branch uh, uh, point singularity, because uh, it's always a pergeometric function. And we can ask the same question as before. Let's look at how this function behaves near its, its singularity. If you do it exactly as before, you find the logarithm. But then you find a series. And now the coefficient of this series, now you see that there are some uh, alternating sign. And it's not surprising, or maybe it is, uh, that the new series you find uh, is phi 1. So it's exactly the series, uh, with the convergent series we started with. That's one of the things that uh, uh, when I first saw it, I said, oh, wow, that's very interesting, because uh, how the original series uh, first uh, knew about the second one, and now the second one knows about the first. And uh, um, you can do it like uh, numerically, in a sense. You can like, really check one by one and see where uh, what happened near the singularity. But in fact, if you look at the digital library of mathematical function, which is uh, available online, you see that these uh, particular hypergeometric functions that are very well studied uh, have a certain property, and in particular, that it's what is called the analytic continuation. So when you try to uh, understand what this function does jumping uh, when you cross this red line, uh, you see that one knows the difference between uh, two of them. Um, it's related to the other one. So somehow there is a, a very um, explicit uh, motivation why this uh, function knows about each other. It's really the property of the function f to 1. But this is one of the instances of resurgence. So the fact that this function is resurgent and that this type of singularity is, uh, um, is what tells you that the new information is there. And uh, in fact, uh, after you have studied all of them, that's it. I mean, you, you will be able to recover and to go back to the starting point in a certain sense. So you have recovered the full information. It's not always like that, but for example, like, uh, uh, a certain class of series, uh, mostly the one that comes from differential equation, this is the case. And let me just make uh, a comment about the two different types of singularity that we have seen uh, and are most th the most studied in the theory of resurgence. So we have seen the simple pole, and we have seen, uh, uh, that was the example with the n factorial, that the only type of information we can extract uh, is essentially what we call the Stokes constant, so this uh, residue computation. And for the logarithmic branch point, is really more interested, but at the same time, might be more complicated. And uh, uh, it's not the, the extra information is not just about a constant, but really about the new series. And it's interesting to see how the series know each other, in a certain sense. So it's really like uh, you go, you you are doing a sort of exploration, starting from one point and try to recover the, the information from the other. And, uh, and as I was briefly mentioning, uh, the fact that these two series know each other is like uh, um, part of the function itself, but even more deeply is a feature of differential of certain type of differential equation. And so in fact, uh, more generally, um, this is in the example I was mentioning, but you might expect also more complicated diagram. What we have seen so far in the, ex in the second example I was proposing you is that if you start with a divergent series, you computed the Borel transform. You use this uh, theory of resurgence, which essentially tells you, look at the singularity and try to see how the function behaves that. You find a new, uh, we found a new series phi 2, the convergent one. 
Now, you can think of this convergent series as, in fact, underlying another divergent series. So you might expect it's just reversing formally the procedure of the Borel transform. You just multiply back by the n factorial. And what you get uh, is uh, this new series phi 2, which is again divergent, whose Borel transform uh, is uh, the um, lowercase phi 2. And if you do resurgence, you go back and you close the, the, the cycle. And in fact, uh, the two solu when you do this, uh, the two uh, divergent series phi, phi 1 and phi 2 are both form a solution of a differential equation. So there is an underlying differential equation. And in a sense, you can even think you are solving the differential equation by um, starting with a formal solution and finding the other one using this technique of resurgence. OK. So that's our way. Um, now, let me just tell you briefly, OK, we, we, um, we understood maybe how this theory of resurgence is computing this new information, but like, why do we care about this new information? What is really telling us? Maybe here you can think it's a way to solve differential equation in a formal way. But uh, uh, I must also tell you that this is not the most efficient way. And in fact, uh, um, already Poincaré knew how to solve this type of equation at a formal level. So in a sense, it's not really what we use the theory for. But uh, um, th there is uh, an underlying uh, um, importance so somehow that we can, uh, and this type of information that we are extracting is in fact useful. For what? Well, remembering at the beginning we say when we start with the divergent series, we don't know how to make sense of them. And so ideally we would like to understand whether there is an analytic function underlying them. So, so far what we have seen uh, is uh, getting a sort of analytic function. So first we did uh, uh, the Borel transform to get something convergent. Then we understood that maybe the convergent thing, if it's resurgent, in fact, uh, it can be extended and have singularity somewhere, but uh, uh, we have access to more information. And here we might expect uh, we are kind of happy because you see analytics. So maybe, OK, we got our analytic function. The problem is, uh, Yes, we got an analytic function, but we are in the Borel plane. So we are in this variable z, zeta. Is there a way to go up and uh, find the analytic function in the original z variable? This is what is called Borel Laplace summation. So in particular, there is a transformation, the so-called Laplace transform, that will allow you to go back. Of course, this is analytic. So while for the Borel transform, you can just apply it at the level of the series, and, uh, and that's fine. For the Laplace transform, you have to do uh, some uh, analytic checks. So see, for instance, how fast the function grow at infinity. But assuming that you can do that, uh, then you will get a function which is defined on this large domain, so on the right hand, uh, F plane. And so this will tell you, uh, this is a way to, to uh, associate to a divergent series. So if you close the loop in this way, an analytic function. And uh, what you can do is, well, I mean, if you, if you study uh, this Laplace transform, in fact, uh, it's, it's defined on a sector, but uh, um, you can also try to vary somehow the angle and see whether this function can be defined on different sector. And the property of the analytic function uh, here can be understood by studying the other analytic function in the Borel plane. So for instance, the information about the Stokes constant, if you are familiar with the theory of differential equation, um, the, st the Stokes constant that you can find, which tells you how these uh, different solutions are described in different sectors, in different domain, can be already understood uh, looking at uh, uh, the level of the Borel plane. So the information we learn below is essentially what uh, um, describes other information about the function above. That's, how, I, mean, I mean, of course, it's not very much precise, but it's and uh, just to give you an idea, so it's important to study, and somehow it's easier at least uh, qualita to study the, the um, function below and try to understand how the information we get can uh, um, tell you something about the analytic function above. Okay, so that's what classic, that, that's really somehow the, mm, the classical part of the theory of resurgence. And uh, maybe I should stress also that uh, these two are the most complicated errors. So sometimes we just stop at this one below, and then uh, um, we just conjecture how the information we get uh, would tell us about something on the analytic side. 
But let me conclude by uh, briefly mentioning what is uh, new about uh, uh, now the theory of, of resurgence in a sense. So what is like a, a new approach that uh, I'm developing with my, with my collaborator Claudia. Now here we mm, go to a more, um, to, to a slightly different framework. So not differential equation and still asymptotic uh, expansion, but we are in the context of topological uh, uh, string theory. So really in the, in the physics, uh, um, in a physics setup. And in particular, uh, we are studying the uh, so-called topological string spectral theory correspondence uh, introduced by Gracia Tsudamarino. So now, without entering in the detail, uh, um, this type of correspondence, uh, as you see, has two sides. Uh, and in particular, we are looking at the spectral theory side. So we focus on an example, which is called local P2. This is a geometric uh, um, object is a surface, a uh, so-called Calabia, sorry, is um, a three-dimensional uh, co complex uh, uh, manifold called Calab uh, uh, Calabiao. And uh, um, in particular, the so-called spectral trace, so something that appears uh, at the level of spectral theory, is given by the following uh, uh, expression. So it's this uh, function z. Uh, this one is because it's the first. Uh, you have other traces as well. And uh, um, it has this com a bit complicated expression where this function phi is called the Fadev de logarithm. And uh, it can also be rewritten um, using this Pokammer symbol, Q Pokammer symbol defined uh, here below. It's not important to remember uh, the structure of the function itself, uh, but uh, as for the gamma function before, the, the important uh, uh, information is that this function is well defined. It is well defined and here the domain uh, is written as the complex plane minus the negative real. So now it has a very big domain of definition. So this is our complex plane and now it's called h bar not z anymore. You cut uh, this part uh, and here it's well defined. So it's very good. But uh, um, we, we, we want to study its asymptotic behavior. So as we did for the gamma, we ask the question, how does uh, this uh, function that behave where h bar now is close to 0 or to infinity? And this is what uh, uh, my collaborator uh, studied, in fact, uh, in uh, her first paper. So if you look at the asymptotic expansion in the true limit, uh, and now here, I'm simply introducing a new variable tau, so okay, a bit more variable. H bar, you said it before, tau is just the inverse of H bar up to some uh, constant. So you take the log of your z function, and essentially you look at the asymptotic expansion as H bar goes to zero, give you phi, and uh, as H bar goes to infinity, or tau goes to zero, same, and give you psi tau. Now, these two functions are divergent, first of all, but they are also resurgent. So you see, they are divergent, okay. Now the coefficients are rational number, non-complex, so even a bit better. We, we know them explicitly, uh, although I'm not writing them here. And uh, um, so they are resurgent because, in fact, we can look uh, at where the singularity are. We know all of them, and they have this very nice uh, structure. So now you see there are not finitely many. You have infinite many singularity, really a tower, where essentially the space here, this A0, measure uh, the distance between uh, uh, true singularity and is constant. So that's why you have this, uh, what we call a tower of singularity. The situation is very similar in the other uh, limits. So if you, go, if you look at the tau to zero, the situation is more or less the same. Now the constant change, but uh, again, you have a single tower. And there are simple pole. So simple pole, again, the example, uh, uh, this example here. So the only extra information that you get uh, looking at the, close to this point is the residue, which is the Stokes constant. And here, what is surprising, because usually is never the case that we get such nice formula, the Stokes constant have, are all determined by this, um, this sum. So they are all known and have this very nice expression. And again, it's kind of almost symmetric in the other case. So they look similar, but not quite. OK, so at the classical, this is, would, would uh, be where we stop uh, at the classical level. We have the singularity. The only information we get are the Stokes constant. That's it. But in fact, uh, um, 
there is something more. Since the Stokes constant, as I said, has this very nice expression, we can look at another function associated to them. This is called uh, an L function. So it's nothing but uh, uh, an expression of this form. You just take the sum of the Stokes constant and then you divide by m to the s. Now, you can always try to write a function like that, but uh, uh, if the Stokes constant uh, don't grow too much, then uh, uh, this is well defined. And in particular, in both cases, they are function now on the variable little s, which are defined on this right half plane. So we have built a new analytic function out of the Stokes constant, which are the data proposed by uh, Resurgent. We know they are well defined. OK, what, is, what we can ask? Now, the idea is, uh, can we understand whether this function can be extended in a larger domain? Now, it's, it's not the same question as before, where we have the function defined on a disk, and we were trying to understand whether we can go outside and find more information. Now it's slightly different. We have, again, something convergent and defined on a uh, half plane. And we want to understand whether we can go and pass across. So in particular, whether we can understand if the function makes sense also on the other side. And trying to answer this question is what is typically uh, what the so-called functional equation does for us. So if you define this lambda 0 and lambda infinity by adding some gamma factor, the, the important thing to, to remember is that lambda 0, remember, of L0 and the other one of L infinity. Well, the two functions are related to each other. So in fact, you can do the analytic continuation. You can pass this uh, half line. And if you do that, uh, you discover that one knows about the other. So if you see if S was greater than 1, using this equality, you find uh, what's going on for S negative, and you find the other solution. So that's very surprising. It's surprising also, I mean, uh, this example is in a sense coming from physics. So it's uh, important because it's telling us something about uh, um, the physics that we, is behind the project, the, the program. But it's also telling us something about, I mean, this is what we hope about the geometry, because uh, uh, there was a geometric object, this local P2, uh, that's entering into the story. And, uh, um, and this is surprising because, uh, again, it's uh, a second step, in a sense, uh, uh, with respect to the new information we are discovering. At the level, from the pure theory of resurgence, we get the Stokes constant. And now we put them together in an L function. And uh, we discover that try to understand whether the analytic function is defined in a larger domain, we end up getting uh, a new information and relate both the regime. So that's somehow the, the summary picture and what we call the new paradigm of resurgence. The idea is that, again, you will see something, a new series appearing after you consider this L function. So now the starting point should be, for us was this, the divergent series we started with, this phi. For instance, you, you start with the limit at 0. You do resurgence, you compute the Stokes constant. That was the only information, uh, the only interesting information, in a sense. But then if you pack them in a L function and you do a certain operator operation called inverse Malian transform, you get another series. And if you took the asymptotic, sorry, you get another function. And if you take the asymptotic, you find another series. And then you can close again the, the diagram. And what uh, is behind uh, uh, the fact that these two series know each other is really what is captured by the functional equation I was writing before that relate the two L function. So this is like how a new information can be captured. In a sense, it's telling you that uh, one limit uh, knows about the other. And it was not really visible at the level of the Stokes constant, but you have to do this uh, upgrade to L function. And so to conclude, uh, um, let me briefly summarize uh, what, uh, what we have seen so far. So this classical paradigm of resurgent function uh, um, it's really the technique and what you can use to extract new information from a divergent series. I think the important uh, um, things to, to, to remember is really that uh, the information are at the singularity in the Borel plane. And that's where, if we look close, uh, we see something new appear. And uh, um, it's typically hard to get access to this information. So I've, I've shown you some uh, nice example, but uh, typically you have to rely on numerical technique to uh, understand where the singularity are and, in fact, where, what type of inf extra information we can find. 
And, uh, um, and this is what is very much used both in mathematics and physics when we study this type of function. Now, what is a bit new is uh, uh, this uh, new proposal that we have uh, uh, with my collaborator. Of course, it's less general because uh, in the example I showed you before, if you only have one Stokes constant or two Stokes constant, it doesn't really make sense to build an L function. So the idea that this new series uh, appear by looking at Stokes constant for the L function it's not as general as the classical paradigm of resurgent. But what we conjecture is that uh, um, this is what will appear in the study of certain type of function called quantum modular form or quantum modular function. And so in particular, um, part of our proposal is to understand whether the resurgence and this new paradigm of resurgence describe and allow us to study uh, a new class of, I mean, this class of function. And yeah, that's all I want to say for today. Thank you for your attention. Any questions? And in your example, <coughs> in your example, you always had nice-looking singularities. What uh, if the singularities are bad? Let's say central singularities. Can you? I uh, know in that case we don't, I mean, um, we don't want to get essential singularity. We can deal with square root singularities, uh, or yeah, but m most likely like the, m many of the machinery developed also by ECAL are very, uh, I mean, are really developed for the logarithmic and uh, simple post singularity. For the uh, square root singularity, you can still use the same technique. The point is really that you need, uh, the idea is going to doing a disanalytic continuation. So um, we can do it for square root singularity, but somehow, yeah, if you have a sense of singularity, then uh, <laughs> yeah, it doesn't work. Yes, um, it's a naive uh, question, but uh, at some point uh, you said that you needed to add uh, some uh, gamma factors to, uh, in order to have a, a nice uh, functional equation. Mm -hmm. Is there some um, heuristics uh, behind the, this introduction of the gamma factors, like what I um, the, what I know from uh, arithmetic geometry is that uh, for uh, L functions associated to varieties, uh, uh, the, the gamma factors you introduce are related with uh, specific geometric um, cohomological quantities, and uh, here is it. Uh, the it's the same. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, I haven't write the. Um the function explicitly, this L0, okay, from, yeah, from here maybe it's not super clear, but in fact, uh, L0 is a product of a Dirichlet L function and the Riemann zeta. Oops. At S, but you have a shift, so it's uh, on the S. And the other one, in fact, has the opposite, I mean. So this is like, and in fact, the, the functional equation relates both of them. You can, what I'm writing uh, in the other slide is it precisely how you would do the functional equation for the L and for the zeta combined. So it's exactly the same, yeah. But in fact, there is something, maybe I can just add a, a comment on your question, because if you're familiar with the, um, with the L function that come from, uh, for instance, a modular form. Mm -hmm. uh, and you try to, so you, now you can use a starting point, uh, let's say a function here, and you try to do this, it's break. You cannot really uh, do the diagram as it is because at the level of asymptotic, you will not find something divergent. You will just find something convergent if it's the L function of a modular form. Mm -hmm. So somehow he, th these, these L function are kind of special in a sense in order to have this diagram closed in this way. It's really related to some of the fact that uh, at this step uh, you get uh, a divergent series. So if you don't have any other questions, we invite you to have lunch, which is served uh, here in the conference center and you may enjoy uh, ITS Park because there is some sun out there and we'll start once again with the presentation of Gilles Blanchard at 2 p.m. Thank you very much. Thank you.